Before I get formally started, I'm going to acknowledge that um, I didn't expect to sit there and feel exceptionally emotional. Um, I got to talk to my husband before coming here last night, and I, I met my husband while I was attending Haskell. And we've been together for over 20 years, and I have Haskell Rascals, which are the children that are produced from Haskell relationships. <laughs> we go back generations. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I'm an extremely proud tribal college graduate. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm getting over a cold. Um, and before I was a tribal college graduate, um, I'm the daughter of a, of a mother that was a native student advisor at a community college. And I helped her run powwows at that community college and make fry bread and sell at the powwows and got to know all her students at that community college. And um, these spaces are important. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, you know, I also didn't know that Norman was going to be here. And Norman, um, I'm really grateful for you. Norman Akers was my painting instructor at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And um, I'm a painter now, and that's how I make my living. And I knew that I wanted to paint ever since I was young. But I never had the opportunity. I never had a painting class until I had my first year at IAI. And my portfolio to get into the Institute of American Indian Arts consisted of um, photographs of my beadwork that I had been doing and the first painting that I had ever made because I knew I wanted to paint. And so I made a painting. I was like, I got to get in for painting. I had to make a painting. So I made my first painting, and my mom still has that piece. Um, and it was you, Norman. You know, you were, you were the first, my first real painting. Uh, instructor and I'm deeply grateful and I give you credit to the day when I speak about the development of my work from between my undergraduate years and my graduate years and I can tell you the one line that you offered that helped that development I remember I was I was proud of the pieces that I made you won't see any of them in the slideshow <laughs> but I, I was proud of the pieces that I made as an undergraduate and I worked hard and I was in that painting studio so much um, me and Henry Payer if you don't know Henry Payer's work take a minute to look him up he's a phenomenal ho-chunk artist and me and Henry were the ones that were in the painting studios till two in the morning painting our hearts away and um and I remember sitting, looking at these pieces, and Norman was like, so, you know, what do you think? How do you, how do you feel about these works? And I made these big abstract works, and they were displayed next to my um, works that I had made in my traditional arts classes. And um, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with them. I'm, I'm proud of them. And, and he was like, he's like, well, <clears throat> are, they, are they what you want? You know, or if something along the lines of, are they there yet? Are they what you want? And I was like, not yet. And he was like, well, what is it? What is the quality that you're trying to achieve? What, it, what do you want them to do? And I remember that studio visit so well with you, Norman, because that questioning helped me solidify how I wanted my works to look and in what vein. And my work changed drastically after that. And it's where it's at today in great part to your guidance. So Wopila, I appreciate you. Um, I didn't expect to come here and get all choked up and cry before I started talking, <clears throat> but um, I got to talk to my husband and tell him, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go get to, I get to talk to Haskell students. Like I didn't, I'm not on Haskell campus, but Haskell students are gonna be here. And that's like, that's our beginning. You know, the beginning of our whole family my half my husband's family lives in Minneapolis now and works in my studio and we just have this you know big beautiful uh family life art thing happening and it so much of it starts at within our tribal college systems and within Haskell so for those of you 
that our students there now that made the trip to come out here and spend time with me just know that um, I'm really grateful that you all are here. And I'm really excited that you all are attending Haskell. And I am very proud to be a tribal college graduate and I hope you all really enjoy your experiences while you're there. And for those of you that are attending the community college here, I feel the same. And I hope you really enjoy your experiences at the community college because great things can come out of these spaces even if we don't get the same credit as the Ivy Leagues. There are great minds in these places. So, all right, now I'm gonna officially start. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my name is Diani Whitehawk. I am Sichangu Lakota through my Ina, through my mom. I'm German and Welsh American through my dad. Matakiapi, Wambli Wiyaka, Washtewi, Machiapie, Washichumie, Diani Whitehawk. I am really grateful to be here. I'm a visual artist based in the Twin Cities, um, Minnesota, and um, I'm going to hit these lights so y'all can see what's going on on the screen. Um, so I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and I lived there until 2000 when I left um, to begin my undergraduate studies at Haskell Indian Nations University, where I received my associate's degree. And I got an associate's degree at Haskell in elementary education because I thought maybe one day I'd teach art. Um, and we didn't have a AA in art or a BA BFA in art at Haskell at the time, so I just exhausted all of the art classes that they offered. Um, got my AA degree there, and then in 2005, um, we moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I got my BFA at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Studio Arts. Um, and then when I, <laughs> this is another nod to Norman, um, when I <laughs> was about to graduate, Norman asked me if I had plans to go to graduate school, and I was like, that sounds interesting, what's that? Um, <clears throat> I didn't even know what graduate school was or what that could offer. And after he started talking to me about it, I was like, yeah, I want to do that. And um, it was also Norman who plugged which programs I should go to <laughs> and who really prompted me to look at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I kept saying, no, I grew up in Madison. I don't want to go back to Madison. I'm done with that city. My family's not there. Like, I've just, you know, I... I my family had been in the Twin Cities for quite some time, and um, Madison just wasn't where I was trying to go back. But Norman kept saying, it's a good program, it's a good program, you should really look into it. And I was reluctantly uh, looked into it, and um, they ended up being the best place for me. Uh, had a very strong roster of painting faculty who I identified with and whose paintings I really admired and then um, was offered a, a fellowship to attend the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So that's where I ended up going. And I'm very grateful for my time there too because UW-Madison was one of the very few institutions that had multiple native faculty. And I needed that home base. I needed that support system in, um, in the graduate system program, which is really challenging, but uh, a really beneficial uh, challenge to have, to be blessed to be able to move through. So I went to <clears throat> back to Wisconsin for graduate school, got my MFA in 2011, and then we moved to Minnesota full time, and I've been there since, um, and I've been there full time since. I spent the first four years postgraduate school working as the gallery director and curator of the All My Relations Gallery, which is a contemporary Native art gallery in Minneapolis. And then in 2015, I transitioned out of that position to focus on my practice full time, and I've been doing so ever since. These two images illustrate much of what my studio practice encompasses and is influenced by. <clears throat> on the left, a large scale painting and on the right is an image of work in progress utilizing lane stitch beadwork on buckskin that eventually becomes a three-dimensional sculpture, which you'll see later in the presentation. My practice is rooted in abstraction, drawing from the histories of Lakota abstraction and abstract easel painting. These are research images that I took at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. If I were to verbally reference various art movements within the lineage of Western art history, most people studied 
in the fine arts um, wouldn't need me to provide reference images in order to understand the particular styles, motifs, or eras that I might be speaking on, simply because these are the histories that are centered and taught across mainstream academia. Yet, in order for people to truly understand my work and the references and histories from which I draw inspiration, it's important to begin with a few images to provide some key examples of various art forms and aesthetics of Lakota and Northern Plains art. So on the top left, you'll see a painted buffalo robe. And on the top right corner is a pair of porcupine quilled moccasins. On the, top, on the bottom left-hand corner is a fully beaded uh, cradleboard cover. And in the center is a uh, painted rawhide or parfletch envelope. And on the right is a woman's uh, Northern Plains wool dress adorned with dentelium. It's really important for me to express that the use of beadwork, quillwork, buckskin, and Lakota art forms and aesthetics is not simply a response to research and looking. This is a picture from my graduation day at the Institute of American Indian Arts. On the right is a case displaying moccasins, quilled hair ties, and a beaded bag that I made in my traditional arts classes and then were included in my BFA exhibition, right alongside large-scale abstract paintings. I later walked in these works during my graduation ceremony, and I continue to dance in them today. This aspect of my practice, works made for cultural participation for myself and my family, is just as valuable and important to me as the works that I create for gallery and museum walls. And this part of my practice deeply informs my studio practice. I also utilize this slide to provide just one example of the many ways that tribal colleges are grounded in teaching artistic practices, art history, and US history from an indigenous perspective. My time attending tribal colleges played a vital role in my personal, cultural, and educational development. This education plays a key role in how I understand and respond to the ways in which Western art history has been and is currently taught in mainstream academia. This education, combined with my experiences in public school, graduate school, and my work as a curator and an artist, continue to inform the kind of change and growth that I believe is necessary in our field to move towards healthier models that value equity and honest representations of our artistic histories across humanity. The desire to see this change, to shift the focus from a predominantly European and European-American male perspective to a perspective that embraces the truth of intersectionality and values the artistic contributions of all cultures remains a driving force in my work. The history and lineage of easel painting also plays a vital role in my practice. Because I spent my undergraduate years in tribal colleges, it wasn't until graduate school that I really had the opportunity to dive deeply into this artistic history. It was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, combing through the stacks at Kohler Library, heeding suggestions of my faculty and peers, and through seminar classes, realizing that I needed to familiarize myself with the various art movements and celebrated artists in Western art traditions, that I fell in love with the era of abstract expressionism, especially with, within the color field and stripe painting era, as well as moments within minimalism. During my research into abstract easel painting, I kept running into intersections between canonical abstract painters and indigenous artists. I'd fall in love with a painter and then read a passage that stated they were active collectors and had a great deal of indigenous art in their collections or they lived near native communities, or were influenced by indigenous art. As I was coming to realize the connections and intersections in these histories, I was also realizing that the work I was responding to most strongly demonstrated intersections of aesthetics. I was drawn to these works because they spoke to my aesthetic preferences as a Lakota woman raised among native artistic practices. During grad school, I continued to study Native art through literature and collections research. This Blackfoot dress is a prime example of those aesthetic intersections that live in my mind when I look at artists such as the examples just shown of Mark Rothko and Marsden Hartley. This is another research image from the Smithsonian of a Lakota possible bag. 
The quill work going across the front of this bag is done in a very traditional Lakota motif. This motif is important to keep in mind as we look at some of the work in the following slides. So as I was finding my way through grad school and working to find a way to honor my various forms of cultural and formal education, as well as various forms of artistic practices, I began combining these influences through concept, motifs, and applications, as well as through mediums. This work, Tioshbae, is the first work I created that utilized porcupine quill work on the canvas. But it took months to make, and quill work is a really time-consuming process. I learned that it doesn't fit the academic calendar well, and in response, I began exploring ways to carry forward the histories, the worldview, and the values that are embedded in quill work into my canvases, but I had to figure out how to do it faster. This is a detailed slide of the quill work that's on, that, on the triptych. So this piece, titled Continuity, is the first work that I created in which I began to mimic porcupine quill work in paint. This allowed me to carry the history of the medium into this and subsequent works while speeding up the process. The left side of the work is painted in that traditional lane motif pictured on the possible bag. As it moves across the canvas, it passes through the plane and begins to move, either becoming disheveled or unraveled or more free and dancing. It's meant to be all of those things. The work speaks to the nature of cultural continuity and the fact that culture cannot be stagnant. It shifts and moves in response to current environments. It may look different over time, yet remains rooted to its origins. These roots run deep demonstrates further exploration of this concept and experimentation in combining mediums, here through the use of stitching seed beads over an oil painting background. These images provide two examples of Lakota moccasins. The image on the left is what's called a moccasin vamp. This is simply the shape that's cut out, of the, cut out and adorned uh, before it's sewn to the sole. And then the image on the right is a finished pair of quilled moccasins. There's so many things to love about collections research, but one of my favorite is the ability to witness moments of innovation and in the way that our ancestors embrace new materials. I also fully appreciate the perspective you get to see of works that maybe don't make it into print um, or aren't in the public eye that example the full living color of our artwork. Our ancestors did not live in sepia tone. Um, I love finding examples of hot pink quills and vibrant checkerboard patterns in collections. Um, I saw a pair of fully beaded Mary Janes once. I mean, there's just there's so much beauty and innovation and creativity in collections. And those pieces that aren't the like um, typical pieces, they don't usually make it into the catalogs, but they're there and they exist. Collections research and my love of moccasins has played an important role in my work. It was during the preparation for my MFA exhibition that I also developed the first in what's become an ongoing series that utilizes the moccasin vamp as a stand-in central figure. This allowed me to create works that provided multiple entry points for various audiences. For native audiences, it's a familiar form. And depending on how I adorn the forms, they can either be vague and ambiguous like this one, or as you'll see in later slides, they can become more culturally specific. Yet this motif also speaks to the history of abstract painting and provides an access point for audiences who may have a mental catalog that includes painters such as Philip Guston and Roger Brown. This was the seminal painting of my MFA exhibition. It is titled Seeing, and it's about the ways in which I see and understand the world through my lived experiences. The center of the work is painted from a reference photo of a South Dakota sky taken on my phone out the window of our van as we traveled back to Minnesota after spending time in South Dakota for ceremony. The window that's created by the four squares in the corners is the shape of the four directions cross or star, a central symbol in Lakota culture representing fundamental principles in our cultural teachings. The blocks in each corner are made of alternating stripes the blue stripes are painterly, referencing the history of stripe painting, and the cream-colored stripes are painted to represent both quill work and lane stitch or lazy stitch beadwork. 
These alternating stripes and the way that they frame the natural world speak to the ways in which I understand our world, artistic histories, and my practice within those lineages, my place within those lineages. All of this work has continued to inform much of what I do today. These two pieces, black and white three and four, are some of the ways that I've continued to utilize porcupine quill work and beadwork in mixed media paintings. Resilient beauty continues earlier conversations regarding cultural continuity and change over time. The section on the left over red is painted to represent strips of quill work or beadwork that appear to curl and lift up off the canvas. The green section on the right is painted to represent cotton calico fabric, which was the coveted trade item for native people going as far back as the earliest trade ledgers. Cotton calico fabric now holds a special and reminiscent place in native aesthetics. It's viewed as old school and often evokes memories of certain relatives or outfits that people dance in. So it's something that can be perceived as traditional now, much like the glass seed beads that have become fully immersed into native artistic traditions, which are originally European trade items. The flowers on the canvas also appear to lift and move. The piece speaks to the beautiful resilience of native people and our artwork in the face of great adversity. There are so many artists within native communities. And despite attempted genocide, assimilation efforts, boarding school and adoption eras, removal and termination policies, our arts endure and thrive. Stealing Horses Back is an oil painting on linen, incorporating lane stitch beadwork. This piece is in response to the prolific appropriation of native artwork in the fashion industry. I purchased a pair of leggings that appeared to be mimicking a native design. Thinking about what to do in the face of continued theft of our cultural work, I thought, well, maybe I can at least symbolically bite back. <clears throat> so I lifted the grid pattern that they had established, changed the color palette to a palette that I pulled from a pair of historic Lakota moccasins, and then I started reinserting Lakota symbolism. And then I beaded over the top portion of the work to kind of soothe and balance out the jumbled pattern below in a way that more accurately demonstrates native aesthetics. Horses hold tremendous value in our culture. So to steal horses back implies taking back something of deep value that was taken from you. Connections is an acrylic painting on canvas incorporating beadwork. The symbols on the moccasins are beaded onto the canvas. The title references the connections we have with one another, our identities and ourselves, our relatives and ancestors, and the land when we put on our moccasins. The opening of the moccasins is painted to allude to a doorway or entry point. These two motifs, the moccasin vamp and the doorway, are collapsed together and further abstracted in the following artworks. The next four pieces are examples in an ongoing series of works that maintain the use of that central abstracted figure, further abstracting the moccasin shape and creating this arc form that also simultaneously can allude to a doorway or entry point. The first three pieces are beaded in colors that mimic their stripe painting backgrounds. The forms are then what sudden, somewhat hidden or ghost-like. The act of beating these forms over the background of stripe paintings forces the viewer to acknowledge the two mediums and the histories embedded within simultaneously. The way art history is taught in man mainstream academia and exhibited in mainstream institutions has historically segregated native arts as something other than. It's a different class in our studies, a different gallery in the museum. Native art has been historically categorized as craft, design, functional, self-taught, historic, ethnographic, etc. Native art curators have often been non-native anthropologists. And as I mentioned earlier, when reading about abstraction in literature, the influence of native art is more often than not a side note, something that plays the supporting role of the perceived primary actor. 
Native art and its influences are often nearly invisible in our national artistic narratives. Yet the reality is Native and mainstream American art histories are completely inseparable. Neither would look the way they do today without the influence of the other through trade or inspiration. But that entire truth is not told in the way that our art history is taught. And the lineage of abstraction that is so central to indigenous art forms simply is not acknowledged or honored in the way that easel painters have been. These works are meant to push back against those hierarchies. The beadwork is on top, so you start there. Yet it is in relationship with the painted background, just as historically these lineages have been in relationship. This is a detailed shot of the bugle beads used in these two larger pieces. Bugle beads are long, thin tube beads. I have my friend Tom Jones, Ho-Chunk photographer and photography professor at UW-Madison to thank for the nudge to start using bugle beads. I deeply appreciate the encouragement he gave to explore this particular bead, and it so naturally extends the use of the painted quill and lane stitch beadwork motifs. This piece, All the Colors, which is a part of the Nerman Museum permanent collection, is the counterpart to black and gold. I often create partner or complement pieces, which is a way to create balance or conversation within a particular idea. And another detail image of some of the beads that are in that piece. The beads are loomed into strips, and then those strips are stitched directly onto the canvas. Untitled Pink and Blue is the latest in that series. And these pieces often use vintage and antique beads. I scour the globe for beads, and um, sometimes contemporary beads come into the mix, like the, the gold that's on this are 24 karat beads, so those are contemporary beads. But the rest of the beads in this piece are all um, very old beads. Detail image. The next few slides are a few more examples of mixed media works that continue to explore the combination of paint and beads. Many people are quick to assume that my work and to write about my work in a manner that centers European and European American modern abstract painting. They position my work as a response to modernism that just happens to incorporate Native American practices, like I'm looking at modernism and then just sprinkling Native stuff on top of it. But for me, the work is centered first and foremost in the artistic histories of my Lakota relatives. This is the place that I draw from first. And the combination of abstract painting and abstract beadwork is an extension of the practices of my female ancestors. It is without a doubt built upon by bringing these practices into works done on stretch canvas and creating them for deliberate participation in museum galleries and a studio-based practice. This piece, untitled Quiet Strength, is the first in an ongoing series that began in 2016. Up until this point, I had utilized the painted references to quill and beadwork as elements within compositions that each provided their own unique narrative or concept. This painting was the first time that I decided that this motif did not need to support a larger narrative, but was strong enough to be the central narrative. The work consists of thousands of painted lines in horizontal rows over an underpainting of gold. The work is meant to pay tribute to the legacy and contributions of Native women to the history of abstraction and to the history of art on this land base. These works also honor the contributions of women at large to the history of abstraction. The stripes on the side of this piece honor both Agnes Martin and some of her color palettes, as well as Native beadwork, as these colors reference antique bead colors widely used in Plains beadwork. The work, both through choices in the composition and colors, as well as through the title, is meant to critique imposed hierarchies that have lifted up certain materials and art forms, such as oil paint, gold, 
bronze, marble, etc., and have devalued forms that utilize materials such as quills, beads, leather, clay, plant fibers, etc. Because of the imposed hierarchies of mediums are associated with artistic practices of certain people, cultures, and oftentimes genders, we've been taught that the work of black and brown folks, as well as women, is something lesser than art with a capital A. These pieces bury the gold in painted strokes that reference porcupine quills, glass beads, dentelium shells, basketry, and more. They reference indigenous art forms and abstraction that has taken place on this land base for thousands of years, pre-colonization, predating the concept of the United States and the Americas. Although these works operate as monochromatic, they each contain a diverse palette of colors that represent the naturally occurring variety in organic mediums, as well as the dance of light that's achieved through the repetition of stacked and stitched beads. Much like the imposed hierarchies of mediums and the extended value placed on people, the title of this series, Quiet Strength, is meant to honor the unique strength of our female and feminine relatives and push back against imposed hierarchies of how we understand human attributes. We're taught that the ultimate form of strength is physical male prowess. We're taught that the ultimate form of intelligence is academic intelligence. Yet, emotional, musical, athletic talent intelligence are all just as valuable. I think about the ways that my athlete husband's body connects with his mind in ways that my body will and cannot even begin to approach. And we all know that one can be an academic genius and lack the emotional capacity to practice genuine empathy. These works acknowledge and honor this fierce, unrelenting, unwavering strength that is unique to women and our feminine relatives. This is the strength that I've been raised by and around. I recognize this in the ways that our mothers and our aunties work to support and nurture us no matter life's circumstances. The way I describe this idea, quiet strength, this is like the one little story that I can kind of use as a, a quick illustration to this thing that I'm talking about, is that most of us know at least one woman in our lives who, if someone in our circle is not behaving appropriately or is getting out of hand, all she's got to do is shoot you that look, you, and you will not step to her. It does not matter how big or small she is, how old or frail she may be, how young she may be, you don't cross that line. Whatever that is, that's unique to women. And then it's this, this quiet yet fierce strength that should be valued as equal to any other form of strength demonstrated across humanity. Because we all have gifts that are valuable. We all bring something to the table and it all balances one another out. The next three works in this series incorporate copper backgrounds and begin to bring in other colors. These pieces, the She Gives Quiet Strength works, extend this recognition beyond our human female relatives and acknowledge our common mother, the land. The background shifts to copper, a metal that's placed at the bottom of the monetary value scale, yet unlike gold, it possesses medicinal value and can purify water. The blacks and grays, as well as the waves, represent stone and water. These works recognize the equal value and importance of all of the materials and elements that our mother provides for us to sustain life. The latest piece in this series is also the largest. The work is seven foot by 10 foot. The size of these works is also intentional. They're meant to uplift and honor female contributions to our artistic history in a manner that cannot be ignored. They hold space. They exist on the wall with equal significance to their abstract male counterparts. And while these works push back against the status quo 
point out systematic racism, sexism, and flawed value systems that support oppression over balance, health and prosperity, which is all challenging and uncomfortable subject matter. They also are intentionally painted in a manner that's meant to offer a gift to the audience. I believe that beauty is medicinal. It's a common human language and it's something we all crave. When we stand in the presence of work that we perceive as beautiful or in the presence of nature, we're filled with awe and gratitude. It fills us in a way that's nurturing and necessary for our health and well-being. These works are meant to be reciprocal. They may ask folks to think through injustices, the truth of our national history, and the ways that that's reflected in our art history, but they're also meant to offer respite, inspiration, and breath. I believe that if the gift is offered, folks are much more likely to be willing to hear the challenging conversations within, with empathy and compassion. This suit of screen prints was done with High Point Center for Printmaking in Minneapolis. The suite is titled Takes Care of Them and is inspired by plain style women's dentalium dresses. The set speaks to the ways in which Native women collectively care for our communities through acts of creation, nurturing, leadership, love, and protection carried out in infinite forms our grandmothers, aunties, sisters, cousins, nieces, and friends collectively care for our communities. As a suite, these works speak to the importance of kinship roles and tribal structures that emphasize the necessity of extended family, tribal and communal ties as meaningful and significant relationships necessary for the rearing of healthy and happy individuals and communities. The idea for the suite of four dresses came from the honored roles that veterans serve within our communities and within the powwow arena. I was inspired by the ways that within our everyday lives, Native women also stand guard, protect, and nurture our well-being. Each print is individually named with a quality that embodies the ways that women care for us all and aims to acknowledge and show gratitude for the many women in my life who have helped create, nurture, protect and lead in ways that have taught me what it means to be a good relative. The Lakota titles are not all one-to-one -one translations of the English titles, yet they're related concepts. When I think of the word lead, the concept within the Lakota title is the kind of leadership I'm thinking of. The Kerry series consists of functional artworks. The first pictured here is a bag. The second and third are copper vessels and ladles. Functional works have historically been designated as something other than high art. The idea being that if something is functional, then that function is its purpose. These works have generally been regarded as craft, and in regard to Native arts, this is not an accurate assessment. There's, a great, there's great intention, thought, knowledge, worldviews, cosmologies, tribal histories embedded into the functional artworks of our ancestors and relatives today. These pieces serve many functions simultaneously. Furthermore, I believe that all art serves a function. Even work that's considered to be strictly conceptual serves a function to spur dialogue. The Carey series is made to push back against old designators that have been utilized to other indigenous artwork. They're also meant to consider when we as native artists bring with us artistic traditions and knowledge of our people into museum and gallery spaces, how does the function of the work change? What do we intentionally carry with us into these spaces? What do we leave out? How can what we carry benefit our artistic communities and society? And beyond, as people, what do our value systems teach us? What do we choose to carry with us going forward? And what will we choose to hold dear? 
The following few images are from a solo exhibition here at the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City. These images provide some context to help people understand scale and installation of the works. And I lied, I only have two. Um, <laughs> this piece is titled, I Am Your Relative, is a photo installation made in collaboration with Tom Jones. The work reflects Oteti Shakoin beliefs and understandings of Mitakyue Oasi, which translates to all my relations. The concept of mitakyuasi speaks to our com common humanity and destiny. It is a deep and fundamental understanding that we are all related and connected to each other as human beings, to all life, and to the land. The health and well-being of one affects all. We all have equal value and inherent worth. The profound invisibility of Native people in our society gives way to gross stereotypes and distorted, sexualized characters that dehumanize and commodify Native women. With invisibility comes a vulnerability that predators know they can utilize and manipulate. As a result, Indigenous women and girls face disproportionately high rates of violence and abuse. According to research from the National Institute for Justice, Indigenous women face a murder rate 10 times higher than the national average with 84% experiencing some form of violence in their lifetimes. 61% of indigenous women, which is three out of five, have been assaulted in their lifetimes. Lack of visibility and the dehumanization of indigenous women in mainstream society have exacerbated violence. Erasure and the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and relatives. This work <clears throat> an installation of life-size photographs of six women wearing moccasins and ribbon skirts specific to their tribes with t-shirts that read, I am more than your desire, more than your fantasy, more than a mascot, ancestral love, prayer, sacrifice, your relative. They're meant to stand as a collective front that asserts their individual humanity and worth as well as the importance of their lives within their tribal communities and our world at large. The work urges the audience to recognize our relatedness and make choices accordingly. That one that says I am, that's my Haskell Rascal. <laughs> Listen is an eight channel video installation made in collaboration with Oglala Lakota and Diné videographer Rizal Benali. The didactic asks the audience, and the video monitors on the side, the didactic asks the audience, how many languages can you identify by sound? Your average American adult, I'm guessing, can most likely identify upwards of 15 to 20 languages simply by sound. Think through those languages. Like if you sat in a, a market or walking down the street, most people, even if you can't interpret it, or you don't know the words, you could be like, oh, that person's speaking German, Spanish, Japanese. You could go down the list. You'd be surprised how many you know that you could pick out just by sound. If you think through those languages, most of those are not going to be from this land base. Most Americans would struggle to identify any languages from this continent. Some might be able to identify one, maybe two, and for most, it's probably never even crossed their minds. Listen aims to chip away at one of the biggest challenges facing Native people, the tremendous lack of knowledge among the American public regarding Native people, history, and our contemporary tribal nations. Because the full national history of this land is not taught in our public education systems, most Americans are largely oblivious to the history and contemporary realities of Native people. Listen is a video installation created for museum and gallery spaces with eight to upwards of 24 monitors as the project grows. In each monitor, footage of land and environment is behind and layered among the body of a native woman indigenous to that region. Each woman speaks for the duration of the video in her indigenous language. No translation is provided. 
The aim is not for the audience to be able to understand or translate what they're sharing, but simply to be introduced to and familiarized with the cadence and sounds of a small sampling of the indigenous languages of this land. Listen provides a window into the immense division between the greater American public and our native nations, as well as the tremendous omissions of truth in how our national history is taught. So we have a, a short trailer that I'll share with you. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> this piece, which you saw in the previous installation pieces, um, <clears throat> is titled Wopila Lineage. And it's a, this is the first in an ongoing series now that consists of eight feet by 14 feet and eight feet by 10 feet fully beaded paintings. The first was created for the 2022 Whitney Biennial and extends concepts that began through the Quiet Strength series. Both bodies of work honor the tremendous legacies of indigenous art by centering the original practices of abstraction on this continent and calling out the lack of representation of indigenous history and contemporary peoples in national narratives. The work encourages critical thinking on how we choose to tell our stories as a nation, institutions, and as communities. These are detail images so that you can see the beadwork. So these are also loomed into strips and then adhered to an aluminum panel system. And this is a sampling of the 18 person crew that it took to create the first Wopila piece. These pieces do not exist without community. This is not something I can do on my own. And the title Wopila lineage speaks to that. It speaks to the tremendous gratitude that I have for our ancestors that upheld the artistic practices that I get to step into and play within today. 
It also acknowledges the deep gratitude that I have for the ancestors that brought each and every single person that's helped us create these works to this place today. Wopila in Lakota is like tremendous gratitude. It's a big thank you. So it's Wopila lineage related concepts of, of deep and tremendous gratitude and the acknowledging of the lineages of these artistic practices, both Lakota and indigenous abstraction and European and European American abstraction and global abstraction and the way that all of those histories make it possible for us to all continue to respond to and uh, continue those conversations, those generational long conversations. Mopila is also a practice. It's a practice of gifting and it's a practice of gifting that recognizes uh, the connections within your communities. Uh, so I see these Wopila pieces as a gift as well to the audiences and to anybody who encounters them. Through sharing the full and complicated truths of our shared histories, we increase opportunities for compassion and healing, which are necessary building blocks for a healthier future. The compositions are rooted in Lakota abstraction, incorporating symbolism that embodies themes of balance, connection, and honoring connectivity across life and land. The scale centers indigenous people, histories, and squarely places our communities and our strength in the present. That's all. Thank you. And yeah, we if we can have just one question, <laughs> we could take a couple of short ones maybe. If yeah, we'll see how it goes. If anybody has a pressing question, feel free. How about any students? Can I can I pick on? Sorry, I know there's more than just students here, but I want to give students center stage if they if they want a moment. Anybody? Anybody? I'm Sichangu Lakota, so Rosebud Sioux, South Central South Dakota. Yeah. Are you? Where from? Standing Rock? All right. Good to, I'm glad you're here. Anybody else have a question? Norman? Yes. Yeah. I think there's, of course, so the question is what kind of um, advice to give aspiring artists, young, you know, and there's, of course, so much, so much, so many things that could be covered. The first thing that came to mind, though, um, is that I really believe that there is, one, there's room for everybody. The art world is huge. Um, two, we all have unique experiences. Like, we're both Lakota, we have unique experiences. You have unique experiences to Standing Rock, I have unique experiences to being Rosebud. My experiences, even with my neighbor or with a sibling or with a relative, are going to be unique to their experiences, even if you're closely adjacent to another person or another tribal member or another uh, student in your classes. Maybe you have similar concepts or similar things or histories that you're looking at, but there is without a doubt something that is unique to your life story and your experiences that can contribute to these generation-long conversations. Each one of us has a unique perspective, a unique lived experience that is different from anybody else. And there is something there for you to contribute to the field. And so 
there's times when you're gonna, I remember when, <laughs> it's so funny because it's very normal when you're first starting for you to, you know, you're looking at, you're researching, you're, you're collecting information. And it's really normal in those early years for your work to reflect what you've been looking at. I remember people telling me in undergraduate, and I didn't see it till they told me, oh, your work's looking like Norman's. And I was like, really? Like, oh my God, I didn't, like, I wasn't trying to do that. Um, but he was my teacher, and I was inevitably looking at his work and learning from him. And I didn't see that at first, but, but it was there. And when I look back at it now, I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. And um, that's normal in the beginning. And then as you develop, I just would encourage everybody to think about, like, what is it that I'm going to bring to the table? What, what do I have to add to this conversation that helps build the conversation, that helps grow the conversation, that takes it in another direction that maybe we haven't looked at yet, or maybe we haven't thought about it yet. And I, I believe that we all have that. So really digging deep into what it is that you have to bring, is that's, that's the thing that I would ask people to be looking for. Thank you all. <clears throat> and, Thanks for bearing through my emotional beginning. I'm just, I'm gonna just quickly wrap up by um, saying thank you again, because it really does mean a lot for me to be here. And I didn't even really understand it to its full capacity until I was sitting there. It's, it's a kind of full circle for me. So I really appreciate y'all coming tonight. Thanks. Thank you.